Dr. Hilgers, how you doing? Welcome to the platform. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Um, happy to have you here. Uh, congratulations. National of the Year. Person of the Year. You know, they probably gave you Black Man of the Year. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that very much. Um, no, I appreciate you. I want to give you your flowers um, while you're here and still alive with us and, and kicking and breathing and doing good work still. Appreciate you, your presence. Um, just from one black man to another, just just thank you. And I hope more people, um, regardless how they feel about the pandemic and your work, just, you know, uh, appreciate your work and uh, the impact you, that, you, that you're trying to have on just not the community of Nashville, but the world. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm really interested in getting into your journey and your story. <laughs> you know, um, I, have, I had, had the pleasure to uh, work with your wife on a few community organizing projects, community oversight board, stuff like that. And so uh, now I'm here to, I want to get into all your secrets and <laughs> <laughs> all of those things with you. Um, and so let's let's talk a little bit about just your upbringing, you know, Camden, Camden Arkansas. Um, you know, what's that like? What was that like growing up? I had a great uh, experience as a child. I was the youngest of seven children. So I have four sisters and two brothers, and I was the youngest of the seven. And... Uh, we lived on one of those streets where every mother on the street was our everyone's mother kind of thing. And so it was a really tight circle and I really enjoyed it. Um, my father got sick when I was 10 and in January of 1968 he passed away and I was 11. Mm. Um, and I didn't really understand it. I was, you know, we have a hospital there in Washita County and I didn't understand why my father could not get more help or care for his illness. So when he died, I was really puzzled and angry, and that was January of 1968. Then in April of 1968, on April the 4th, at 6.01 p.m. in mm. Memphis, Tennessee, MLK. MLK was assassinated. He had become my superhero. So losing my dad and then four months later using MLK, I was a, I was a pretty angry uh, young man, and uh, you know, Thankfully, I grew up in a small town in Arkansas because I lived in one of the big cities where all the things happened. Who right. knows what would have been my future. So right. I think that was part of God's plan, baby. Yeah. You grew up in a, um, a hard era for black folks. You mm -hmm. know, not many opportunities, um, not just for people telling you you can't do things, but just laws, right, telling you yes. that you're not allowed to do things. Yes. Um, I'm, a lot of times when I talk with um, folks from that era, a lot of times they, they tell me, you know, hey, like we really didn't know because we was kids. Our parents kind of shielded us. Mm -hmm. We remember certain things mm -hmm. um, from that. Was, so was that the case, you know, for you or did you, how it, was that? It, it, was, it was the case for me because uh, my mother is the one who I actually say prayed me through because I, I was just so, I was enraged actually. I just couldn't believe these things that had happened, and my mother challenged me to do something about it. So I decided to uh, I become a doctor. But the problem is that in 1968 at the time, I didn't had never seen a black doctor, didn't know if you could be a doctor if you were black. And I tell people that there are a lot of folks around me who are very discouraging, but my mother was not. And there's this group I love, uh, Sweet Honey and the Rock, you probably know them. They had a song that goes, uh, there were no mirrors in my Nana's house. Mm. So I didn't know that my hair was too nappy, my nose was too big, my lips were too thick mm -hmm. to do the things. And so I think my mother took down the figurative mirrors, so I didn't know that I couldn't do these things. Right. Because she uh, kept me focused, and that's really how it happened. I think that if I had had a different mother, perhaps I wouldn't have been able to make that journey, but thank goodness right. she got me through. I had I was doing my research and I read something about like when you had decided like that you wanted to be a doctor and you had mentioned that um, at the time magazines were rank yes like, the top universities and then that's how yes. you came up with like oh Harvard is where I want to go right I mean I I've always liked doing to to read and study and make plans so I went to the Washington County Library and I read about doctors and medicine and medical school and you're right at the time. There were magazines that were doing rankings of schools based on your likelihood of getting into medical school if you're pre-med. And Harvard was head and shoulders above all the rest. 
since I, since I knew my chances were limited mm -hmm. because of where I lived and the fact that I was black, I decided I got to go to Harvard. I mean, I got to, that's my best shot. Right. So I just made a decision at age 13 that that's what I was going to do, and I just stayed focused. I went to bed thinking about it. I got up thinking about it. It was my life's mission to at, get into Harvard. At 13 years old? Yes. Now, Dr. Hill, just now tell us now. At 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, small town, you had to get a little bit of trouble. You know, you no, had to. <laughs> no. In fact, my, my, my buddies all thought I was boring because, uh, you know, there was a time that uh, I think we were in my mother's car and one of my buddies, who remained nameless, took out a joint and wanted to smoke the joint. And I said, oh, no, y'all not going to y'all not going to mess up my plans. Wow. So, yeah. You were that serious? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. There was nothing that was going to keep me from achieving that goal. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Like, that's that's like very high. Um cognitive maturity well no but i think the focus came from you you have to understand how how angry i was and mm -hmm. how um, enraged i was at what had happened and it took a lot to quench that and that rage just turned into this amazing focus and drive that nothing was going to stop me i mean nothing was going to so stop you, ch me. you channeled that mm -hmm. and that was from your dad's passing and martin yeah. luther king's passing yes and my mother's great the ability to take all those right. mirrors down. Does that still drive you today, to this day? Yes, and I tell people, um, it's like that big green guy from the Marvel movies, whatever his name is, the Hulk. Uh -huh. He says, you know, I think you have to make him angry for him to turn into yeah, the... Yeah, to transform. And he actually reveals his secret that he's always angry. Uh -huh. He just does it when he wants to. So mm -hmm. I'm always angry. I've been angry my whole... I'm still angry about it. And... When you watch what happened in the pandemic, um, a lot of organizations had an epiphany about the health disparities in our country. Right. When some of us have known that these things have existed for decades. Right. And uh, it makes me angry that we keep saying we value our lives the same, but if you look at what happens in our in our country, it's clearly not the case. All right. Harvard University. Um, me personally, you know, I I don't know. I don't think any black folks that I knew ever went to Harvard, felt like they could go to Harvard, mm -hmm. you know, um, and even living and being born and raised right here in Nashville, Tennessee, where we have, quote unquote, the Harvard of the South, um, as uh, many of us has grown to know it at Vanderbilt University. Um, but I didn't believe I could, you know, I could go there. You know, I, I wasn't encouraged at my high school or by my guidance counselors, mm -hmm. like, that's for you. And I, that was kind of the same similarities from just local teenagers that we grew up here in North Nashville, specifically for me. Right. Ah, that, that, that school may not be for us. It's not welcoming for black folks and people that look like us. And so we chose different, different yeah. routes. Um, actually being able to attend Harvard, what was that? Culture shock? And yeah, oh, yeah. It was definitely culture shock. But I also point out that there are some teachers, all of whom were white, thought that I was... Uh, you know, living out a fantasy and that I should go to vocational school and be content with that, um, you know, be a carpenter, plumber, electrician, whatever. Um, but I had a couple of teachers, but always my mother in my corner telling me that if you uh, stay focused and you work hard and you keep your belief in God strong, which has been a big part of my journey, the faith piece. Um, and I, of course, I got there, and I'm this poor black kid from Camden, Arkansas. You got all these folks who've gone to to um, boarding schools and had their own, uh, you know, bank accounts and funds they could draw on. And I just, I just stayed focused. I went there for a reason, to get into medical school. I was not trying to become an elitist. So I wasn't trying to become what Harvard was. Right. I was trying to get from Harvard what I needed right. to achieve my life journey. And so, uh, but a lot of people were caught up in the fact of being at Harvard and being at this elite institution. That wasn't me. I, right. just, I had a singular goal. Right. What were some of the navigational tactics that you had to acquire, <laughs> <laughs> adapt in that space? Well, I think the thing that all, many of us did, because keep in mind, this is in 1975, and right. uh, there weren't many black students at Harvard, so we kind of formed our own support group. Mm -hmm. And I was in 
Harvard had a system of, they called them houses, but they were actually dorms where the kids live, students live. So we were in Leverett, Leverett Hall. And so all the black students in Leverett, you know, formed a group and we had, we ate lunch together, we ate dinner together, we had parties and all that. So we kind of formed our own support group and many of them have the same stories I did. They, they come from places that had never sent black kids to Harvard before. Right. And I think that's a, something I've carried with me that there's always gonna be people who can relate to your, to your story, your mission, and we just have to support each other, which right. is what we did. What were some of the challenges that you faced um, on just initially being there? Well, well, the first challenge I faced was a huge case of the imposter syndrome. I have to just admit it that it's very intimidating to be at a place where um, you're surrounded by students, kids who've gone to you know, prestigious schools to get there, their families are well known. I think when we were there, um, uh, the daughter of the um, ambassador to the UN was there. There's some other famous politicians that kids there. So it was, it was intimidating. But my first powerful impression was when I worked onto, walked into Harvard Yard for the first time, and I wasn't focused on anything but this huge building, Widener Library. Hmm. At the time, it was the largest collection of books in the world. Wow. And I just stood there marveling at this huge building with millions of books inside and loving to read as I did. I just was just caught up in the wonder of it all. Can you imagine that? That here's a place with just you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of books, and it's right there in front of me. It's hard to believe. And so you studied chemistry. Yes. <laughs> was it, how difficult was that at Harvard uh, University? No, uh, well, I just, I, I started out in biology. Mm -hmm. When I took my first chemistry course, I fell in love with it, and it just seemed almost instinctive to me mm. that once you understood how the electrons and protons moved in relation to each other, it wasn't hard at all. Conceptually, it's just a beautiful, because there's math involved, there's physics, right. but once you understood the concepts, right. and you could apply the concepts, it almost became intuitive to me, so I loved chemistry, still do. And so, you graduated from Harvard, you know, magnum cum laude in chemistry. That was 79? Yes. 79. And so, and this is still, you know, a very unique era in time. You yes. Know, Black Panthers are not too far behind that in That's the right. 70s. That's right. That's right. Um, and so, um, you transitioned into um, um, Oxford University, right, in England. Mm -hmm. um, was this your first time abroad? Yes, of course. Um, I I had never been out of the country before. First time getting a passport. Yes. All of those all things. Those things. All those things. Yes. Um, how was that experience and journey in, uh, in England? Well, you know, people may not know this, but Phyllis and I, my wife Phyllis, we met at Harvard. And uh, the year that we graduated, I believe, there's a huge racial strife happening all over the country, but in Boston in particular. And I still remember there's a a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph that was on the front of the Boston Globe of this black attorney coming out of, of the downtown center. He's obviously wearing a very expensive suit with a very expensive briefcase and he's crouching down holding the briefcase over his head because three white teenage boys had literally lifted the flagpole out of its stand and were about to pummel him with it and the flag is waving. So the American flag is waving on this pole that's about to hit this black man who's walking out of, uh, and he's the, he's the epitome of success. He's a very successful attorney walking out of the building and these three teenage white boys are about to beat him with the, with the American flag. It sort of captured the whole experience wow. for us. And then when we got to England, England was in a recession. So it didn't matter what country you came from, if your skin was brown or black, you were not received very well. Mm. So as, soon, as long as we were on the Oxford campus, things were fine. But as soon as we left the campus, go out into the, into the city proper, into London, it was not very pleasant. So I tell people, I mean, I grew up in the South in the you know, 50s and 60s, and things happened to me in Boston and Oxford that never happened to me. Really? In the Deep South in Arkansas. In, in, yeah. I mean, it, it was sort of ironic and unexpected, but it was actually true that uh, 
some of the things I experienced as a college student and graduate student in Boston and Oxford were very unpleasant. Was there any time while you was experiencing these things, you, you was like, I don't, I don't know if I can do this or? No, it just, it just made me more determined that I was going to finish the journey I had started to witness the ignorance and the hate and all that. Um, and I still remember when I got the Rhodes, I was a Rhodes Scholar, so when I got the Rhodes, some of my colleagues and even a couple of my mentors suggested that I should turn down the Rhodes to make a statement about the prejudice and the hate because Cecil Rhodes had made his money by exploiting black laborers in his diamond mines. Mm. So they thought I should make a statement by turning down the Rhodes Scholarship to make that. And I thought to myself, what better thing for me to do than to have this man turn over in his grave that a black man should get his money because his will specified right. white students from English-speaking countries. So, wow. Yeah. So I thought, I'm not going to turn it down. In fact, I'm going to take it and do all I can with it because because of who it was right. that made it possible. And I kind of I kind of want to pivot a little bit because you, you, you're heating up. And uh, I want to go ahead and uh, just jump into it because I think this is it's crucial, I think, for many people to understand. But I kind of, I'm curious, too. You know, was your, during this time and the decisions that you was making, was your blackness ever questioned by peers or others? In what, of course. Of and course. how did you handle that? Because what we find, and I want to dig in this too, especially around the pandemic, is when we have people of color, specifically black folks in, in positions, high positions, positions of power, you know, it's that double consciousness thing. Mm -hmm. And we hold, you know, um, our black leaders, um, whether they're politicians, whether they're doctors, whether they're lawyers, any kind of high status of society, we hold we hold them at a higher account, and we hard on them. Mm -hmm. um, so how how did you navigate that? Well, I mean, clearly, someone with my credentials is not typically black like me. You know, Harvard. Oxford Rhodes Scholar, Johns Hopkins Medical School. That's not a, you wouldn't expect that person to stand up and you see that they're black. Right. So it's been many times I've been introduced prior to the internet age. I'd go to a meeting and they would introduce me and I would get up as the person they're introducing and some people would look at me funny like, really? Right. You know, so, and then there are others in my own community who believe me to be, uh, that going to the places I've gone they would express to me surprise at being as humble as I am and I have to let them know a little secret. We get back to that big green guy again. That uh, my humbleness is actually the ultimate form of arrogance. Right. I tell people this all the time because when you know that God has a plan for your life, mm -hmm. you, don't need to, you don't need to be out front with all that stuff. Um, and I don't have to do that because I know that the good Lord has made it possible for me to do things I do. So right. that's why this faith piece is so important. And I let people know I didn't go to those places to become what they are right. or what they symbolize. Right. I did all those things to get me ready to do what I'm doing. Right. And when I, when I see people of color sitting at certain tables and rejecting or not focusing on the fact that they are persons of color, it makes me a little bit angry. I've never run away from the fact of who I am. Right. I'm a black man living in the United States, and that means certain things. Right. And uh, I make people nervous because I talk about racism openly. Racism is not th theoretical. Right. Racism is real. Right. And it doesn't matter what domain you look in, whether it's business, law, politics, education, medicine, across the board, there are structures in place that disadvantage me because of my black skin. Right. In that medical space specifically, um, how did that show up? Whether it's, you know, peers, whether you as a, as, a, as a student, graduate student in medicine school or as you became a professional and finished, how did that, that discrimination or microaggressions um, kind of show up in the, in the workspace or in the, in, in just in the space of medicine for you? Well, <clears throat> Well, there are a lot of examples I mean, I could give. Uh, when I was a medical student, they would pair us up 
for the rotations with the attending. So we'd have two students and an attending physician, and we'd make the rounds and learn from the patients. And there are two incidents that stand out in my head. One is we walk into a patient's room, and this 20-something-year-old medical student, not even a doctor, starts addressing this 92-year-old patient, black man, by his first name. Mm. I said, oh, no. I actually said it. You don't know this man. Right. Okay. It, you should be calling him Mr. Johnson. Right. Right. You, you, and both the attending and the other medical student, who are both white, took umbrage with the fact that I'm pointing out that this man deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Right. And then there was another instance where I'm paired up with a, a white medical student. This time happened to be a woman. And we go and we, you know, talk to the patient, we come out, and as if I'm not even there. Right. I mean, this, this attending is focusing all of his attention and the teaching to the student. And I just interrupt him to say, well, you know, I pay my tuition too. Mm. I want to learn as well. And again, uh, they didn't, I mean, he, was, he took offense to the fact that I'm pointing out that I, I'm here. You exist. I exist. Right. Okay, you can't just ignore me, right? And so, you know, I got written up a couple of times because I would actually speak my speak my mind um, but it's again there's things that happen that make that anger it's always there right not going, it's not, never going away right. but sometimes right. things happen that make me want to um, tap into it and let people know that things are not acceptable right you know that's a that's a lot to bear for one person um, who who is that that person or that community that you can go to that could understand your journey, what you was dealing with, and you know, kind of kind of prevent you from turning into the actual Hulk, right? Instead of <laughs> instead of keeping it in and just you know. Well, I think uh, one one person for sure who contributed that was my wife Phyllis because we met at Harvard. We've been married for forty two years, so. She'd sometimes be the one who would have to, uh, you know, help me to, <laughs> right. to have a different approach. Although my wife, as you know, when she needs to, she will. Yeah, she, she can get she'll bring, up she'll, too, yeah. she'll bring it, right? Uh, <laughs> so, but I also think being the father of two amazing children helped as well because I have to keep keep them in mind and make sure that they're going to be right. healthy and well. Um, but. Until she died, my mother was clearly uh, a wonderful resource. She never made it past the eighth grade, but she was brilliant hmm. and wise. That's, that's amazing how um, a lot of, like, for example, like my grandparents um, have similar stories, and their parents, like, not much education, mm -hmm. um, formal education, but was able to instill a lot of powerful things that allowed the next, their kids, next generation to go further and beyond right. and to the next level. Right. Um, and it's just the resilience, right, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of people, but especially of our of black community that we've had to have here in the United States. Um, it's one of a kind. And that's what I tell my students and young people that uh, even for myself, I recognize that some of the opportunities I have are not because I'm so smart or because of anything that I've done. There are probably hundreds of people, thousands of people whose names we'll never know, right. whose stories we'll never know, but their sacrifices made it possible for certain doors to be open, and I never take that for granted. Right. I tell people that my brother Charles, who's 10 years older than me, is the real, the real bright one, smart one in our family, but he would not have the opportunities I had because he was born too soon. So I just, I never take anything for granted. Wow. You're navigating all these things, doing all these great things, you know, in your profession, um, counteracting all the, the negative energy that's coming your way and still figuring out the way to, you know, stay focused, mm -hmm. um, reach your goal. Um, what was, I guess, your actual end, end goal for your profession at that time? Um, you say, hey, this is the point I want to make it at, and this is kind of how I want to leverage and use all my experiences and, and my credentials to do this. So as you're 
as I pointed out earlier, my motivation for uh, doing what I was doing was my father dying when I was 11. Mm -hmm. So my actual goal was to go off to these places, get my medical degree, get my training, come back to Arkansas. What I really wanted to do was to establish some medical centers in Arkansas. At the time of my father's death, I think there are 75 counties in Arkansas. 90% of the doctors were found in two, two places, Hot Springs and Little Rock. If you lived outside of those places, the number of doctors was few and far between. So my idea was to shift the distribution of doctors to make that more equ equitable. So that was really my goal. But another Rhodes Scholar, who was 10 years my senior, Bill Clinton, got elected governor. And to be quite honest, uh, he actually changed the profile of health care in, in, in the state of Arkansas, which uh, didn't give me an out, but it certainly changed my perspective. And when I got to uh, Oxford and did my PhD in immunology, my goal was to come back and become a transplant surgeon because the goal of transplant surgeons is to transplant an organ and not have the immune system reject it. So immunology owes a lot to people studying transplant for major discoveries. But when I did my first clinical rotation as a medical student, if not the first, one of my first patients was a black woman in her early 20s. She had given birth to a baby, and both of them had HIV, and there was mm. nothing we could do for them mm. except treat the symptoms and watch them die. So after talking, thinking about it and talking about it, I changed my plans from transplant surgery to focusing on HIV, and that's what I did. So, and I tell people all the time that one of the things that I've given myself permission to do is to follow the passions I have. Right. Because if you do that, and I tell my, my students and young people that all the time, because you don't want a good job or a good career, you want a great life. And when you follow your passions, that's exactly what will happen. You'll just have a great life. Um, I was reading some of the, um, again, some of your research and stuff um, about HIV. Um, along with the pandemic, right? And how similar, in a way, politically, yes. they kind of were, right? And you mm -hmm. said something that, just before my time, I was just too young to really understand this, but you said, um, because HIV affected, like, white men, mostly, um, that Ronald Reagan waited five or six years to sure. even announce that it was an issue, right? right? Um, and it could have been the same thing with the, with the pandemic, yes. right? On how <clears throat> former President Trump delayed yes. and waited, right? And this is a quick backstory about me, Dr. Hildrew. I came back, I was living in China. Mm, okay. And I came back 2019, October. I've been there for two years. I was living in Shaman, China. And so just a few months before, you know, December. Right, right, right. And then we heard about it. Okay, we got this pandemic, yeah. this virus is happening and in Wuhan. And then only a few months later, exactly. you know, and I thought, oh, man, I, I dodged it you, just yeah, in time, yeah. right? Yes. And you March 2020, you know, yes. you know, we caught up, caught up with us in the United States. Yes. But that was interesting that you, you made those two kind of. Well, but, you know, I've had the misfortune of having to live through two hmm. pandemics. Actually, there are three pandemics. If you put in tuberculosis, I think in some ways it's still a pandemic. But. In 1981, in the summer of 1981, there's all these reports in New York and the West Coast of young men who all happen to be white and gay getting diseases that indicated their immune systems were failing. And we knew we had a big problem on our hand. It turned out to be a virus. Well, because of the social construct of the time of homosexuality not being viewed as anything other than sin, the politicians thought, well, we don't have to worry about this because it's, right. it's, it's gay men, and who cares about gay men? They're sinning. So you're right that it took six years for Ronald Reagan to acknowledge that HIV was a problem. And as you know, for number 45, went on saying complete nonsense and untruths about COVID-19, even after I think there had been 5 million cases and lots of people had died before he finally started telling the truth about it. So those are two striking parallels that illustrate how important it is 
for leadership to not let social constructs or prejudice get in the way of responding to a right. public health crisis. Right. And I'm really curious, you know, I want to get more into like the pandemic here in Nashville, right? And your, and your role and your leadership into that, uh -huh. uh, being at Meharry. Black folks have a very unique experiences with vaccinations and um, those sorts of things here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of weary of it. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to be getting a shot, you know, because of like what happened at Tuskegee sure. and these sure. other things. Yes. And what are they, you know, what are they, you know, put me into? And then, so you get all of these, social media is here too. Yes. And so oh, yes. everybody's an expert. Everybody's a Dr. <laughs> Hill at this point, right? That's right. Um, you know, and, and, and we have the right to caution. But you know, at at what point, right? Do we do we say, okay, what's going on here? And you're in a very particular, peculiar, you know, uh, position because you're a black man, mm -hmm. and right. And so mm -hmm. you already know what's going to come with it, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> regardless of all your credentials and studies, you know what's going to come with it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have some people that are saying, okay, right, we need to get the shot, right. Huh? Why is he supporting this vaccination? He's a black man. He said, "No, ah, you know, right." And so, when all of this was happening, right, what was your initial approach when you knew? Like, cause I'm pretty sure you understood this already, right? Mm -hmm. And so, what was your initial kind of thinking and like how you was going to tackle this community wide? Well, the first thing is. I thought the WHO declared it a pandemic two months too late. In fact, mm -hmm. I remember sending a tweet about that uh, life is about to change in a way no one's ever seen before and we should get ready for it. And I did that in January when it took WHO until March to declare it. Um, but, you know, having been studying viruses for, since I was a, a junior in college, I kind of knew what we were going to be up against. But as a black man who had knew a little bit about medical history, I knew there was going to be a problem because it's not just Tuskegee. It's involuntary sterilization of black and brown women. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, if you read the history and study the reports, it goes all the way back to 1619. I mm -hmm. mean, it's not, I mean, it's been happening. Things have been done to black bodies in the service of research and medicine for 400 years. Right. So I knew we had a, so we had to first accept that people have a legitimate reason for being a little bit mistrustful of medical research. Right. So I start there by saying, yes, you should be. And then I try to explain to them how this is different, how the one of the scientists who discovered mRNA vaccines, or at least the technology to make it possible, is a brilliant black woman, Dr. Kizzy Corbett, who's now at Harvard on the faculty, uh, that there's something called a data safety monitoring board. These are independent observers who get to watch the trials and see the data. Mm -hmm. They're the only ones who know who got what, the vaccine versus the placebo. They have the power to stop the trial if they think that the safety has been compromised. Persons of color were part of all those data subject monitoring boards. Then finally, when the trials are over and the data goes to the FDA, FDA convenes a panel of independent scientists to review the data to make recommendations. I'm on that panel, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Dr. Fuller from the University of Michigan, who's a black woman, she's on that panel. So I try to just have people understand how this is different, but to acknowledge there is reason to be mistrustful, but to try to give them a perspective that this is a little bit, this is different. Right. You know, it was certain instances where you were called out, you know, mm -hmm. via social media. Um, sure. By black folks. Sure, of course. Right? How did you, did you even, how did you take that? Well, I took it for what it was, and, and I think that when people don't know you and your story and all that you've lived through, you just have to say, well, I, it's not going to stop me from doing what I know I need to do. Right. I could not live with myself, and I cannot unknow what I know. Right. And for me to not say the things that I've said and to do the things I've done, I don't think that that box would have been checked when I'm standing at the gates. So I'm going to do what I got to do. Right. Um, this also kind of, also led to you being appointed by President Biden, right, on the COVID nineteen um, health equity task force. Yes. Um, what what did what did that mean? What did what what did that mean for you and and for those who just don't know what happens on that task force? So I think the task force was formed to acknowledge that in our country there's a chasm in the health status of black and brown people 
and white people. And that the pandemic revealed this in a way that few things could. Mm -hmm. Because if you had underlying conditions, you're more likely to get really sick and they're more likely to die. And what does that mean? That means that minority communities. Right. So President Biden took the initiative of appointing a group of individuals across the spectrum of backgrounds to review what is happening and make recommendations for change. So I felt that as a scientist who understands viruses and what the pandemic was doing because of the virus, as someone who's voted my whole life to focusing on trying to make sure there's equitable access to, to medical research and healthcare and all that for black folks. I mean, I, I thought I had something to contribute, so I was happy to be a part of it. Um, you know, but he had, there are people on there representing incarcerated individuals, mm -hmm. people representing handicapped individuals. So I think I learned a lot from my colleagues, and to me that was a great part of this, is just learning from other people and hearing their perspectives. Equability, right? We are we hearing that a lot. We want a just and equitable community, world, right. city. Um, what does that look like in um, the medical field and, and for for just and equitable health care? So, like with all the other th domains of our lives, racism and bias is a big part of health care. Uh, people know this or should know it that. We've known for a long time that black and brown patients are not treated the same necessarily as white patients. In fact, there's research to show that if you take two model patients who are actors, you give them the same job, same income, same zip code, same everything, and you send them to, to a doctor, the white patient is much more likely to get the most aggressive uh, treatment plan that gives the best outcomes than a black person. Even though, every, even though everything about them, except their skin color, is the same. We also know that algorithms are now being used to determine treatment plans. What happens is these large data sets are being used to develop algorithms that can predict outcomes, can recommend treatments, and even those algorithms are biased. Mm. I'll give you an example. There's a bias used, and there's an algorithm used in ICUs to determine who should be put on a ventilator. And one of the reasons why black patients often didn't end up on a ventilator compared to white people in the same ICU unit was because the algorithm favored the white person or biased against the black person. I mean, people need to know this stuff. Right. right? That, 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 that. And then when it comes to acceptance in the medical school, I believe that we have a problem that when I enrolled in medical school, I think there were about 550 black males who matriculated that year, who entered medical school that year, uh, new class, new in new classes. If you fast forward 30 years to, uh, you know, uh, 2012 or 2015, whatever the year was, that number had dropped, actually dropped mm. to 512. Even though, the when I started medical school, there were 120 medical schools. There were 20 additional medical schools by this time, thousands of additional seats. So white women, white men, Asian men, Asian women, uh, and black women all gone up, but black men went down. Mm. And part of it is the pipeline, but part of it is also implicit bias against right. black males, as you, right. as you well know. Right. So healthcare is not different from any other domain in American society where bias is playing a role, right. both in interactions between patients and mm -hmm. physicians, but also in who gets to become physicians in the first place. It's, it's, it's interesting you say that because being somebody, um, you know, in community for a long time, community and development, domestically and abroad, you hear about like hunger, you hear about housing, you hear about policing, um, you hear about education, you know, medical, Healthcare tends to not get that same type of light shined on it, not until the pandemic happened. Right? Exactly. And then we was like, oh my gosh, right? You know, what can we do? What can community do? What can, you know, civic leaders do to, to make sure healthcare is, equitable healthcare is addressed, you know? And just, just, just I don't know, if, does that happen in medical schools? Is that something that's talked about in the classrooms as well? Um, implicit bias trainers with doctors, you know, like how do we try to correct some of these systemic I, things? 
I think that the general public just need to be made aware of just how how pervasive this phenomenon is of of, of bias and racism in you know now healthcare only accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of our overall health right. those social determinants of health that we've read about and heard about account for the rest where you live where you work how much money you make what schools you go to what schools you can send your kids to and then finally having access to health care but if you probe deeply enough in all those areas racism and bias will raise its head as a factor so but I think we have, to, we have to make sure we're holding leaders accountable, that when decisions are made and policies are made, the question should be asked, can this be executed in a way that's fair to all of us? Right. That is not going to bias one group against another. And how does your role in your position now play a part in making sure that happens? Well, I think that being the leader of the largest, oldest, independent, Academic Health Science Center in the country gives me a platform to keep this keep this problem in the forefront of leaders of national organizations and elected leaders. So I'm trying to do that. But at the end of the day, we as as voters and taxpayers mm -hmm. have to call, hold leadership accountable for policies and things that are equitable. Right. But you know, as you watch what happens around the country. It seems that hate is being, hate is being, is driving some of the decisions being made, right. where laws are being passed that uh, would seem ostensibly, at least, to reflect a strong bias against certain members of our population, and to me, that's unacceptable. And uh, we just have to start making it known by who we vote for that we don't, that that's unacceptable. Um, do you have you, and do you get any pushback to? You know, Dr. Hendricks, I don't. Maybe you shouldn't. You know, uh, you know, maybe you should stay course, neutral in this, or maybe. Yes, I do. Uh, I mean, my team members are often nervous about some of the things I put in social media. But uh, at the end of the day, if I don't speak my truth, and if I think my truth can be impactful in making things better for people, right. I just feel I have to do that. And I'm speaking my truth. I'm right. not speaking anybody else's truth. Right. Right. And so I think I'm entitled to do that. Uh, I think I've earned the right to speak my truth, and right. so I'm going to keep doing that. What do you feel is next for, you know, our community here in Nashville, the state of Tennessee, the United States, when it comes to this pandemic? Is it, is it, is it just going to be a part of our social fabric going forward? Oh, yes. Is it, you know? Yes. I think coronaviruses are going to be with us for some time to come and uh, what happens next all depends on when and if a new variant occurs that the vaccines we currently have do not work well against and there's already indications from Israel for example where they've given a fourth shot of the mRNA vaccines and there's an improvement but it's not as significant in fact it's no better than the flu vaccine mm. so what that tells me is that we probably come to a point where new and better vaccines are needed. Uh, now, thank goodness that these vaccines were available to us as quickly as they were, because God only knows what will happen without those vaccines. Right. But I think viruses, especially RNA viruses like the ones we're dealing with, have built into their biology to mutate and become different and get better at doing what they do, which is to infect us and be transmitted from one person to another. Right. So it's no surprise that SARS-CoV-2 is doing that. So I think that at a minimum, the viruses are gonna become endemic. And what that means is that there'll, there'll be local outbreaks in different places. And as long as we respond quickly to those outbreaks, and I think these, the drugs, especially the one from Pfizer, that's 90 plus percent effective. If those can be given quickly to those who test positive, I think we'll be able to control this. But if a variant arises that the vaccines do not cover, then all bets are off because we might find ourselves back in the kinds of situation we were in back in 2020. For community members that, you know, um, have got the vaccines, have got the boosters, and, you know, it's been boosted as much as they can be boosted at this point. 
um, and still happen to catch the virus and now have different questions or community because the information is just coming in so rapidly and everybody yes. is not doctors everybody don't right. under, can't can't understand the verbiage sometimes that is being used where are some resources where are some places community can go to kind of get simplified but also accurate information to to give to help them make a you know a healthy and the best decision they need to make for themselves or their family or just be aware of what's just happening and changing on a daily weekly monthly basis well i with with a couple of caveats i think the cdc is still a a reasonable source of information that is that is helpful even the local health department i think metro health department has done a great job of staying up to date on what is happening and i think their website is a is a good one but i would also recommend for those who really want to know what's happening in the sort of in the grand scheme of things the w who website for COVID 19 is excellent it tells you where things are happening what the new variants are it has updates on vaccines because there are actually 20 plus vaccines now being used around the world so wow. mrna vaccines are not the only ones um, and so I think the WHO website is, is really, really good. And, uh, you know, so I think those are some places that people can look to to get information. And also the Meharry website for COVID-19 has some, some good information for people who want it. So I think, you know, those are good sources. But thankfully, if you've been boosted, vaccinated and boosted, and if you get infected, it's very likely that you're going to be asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms. So the vaccines are doing what we need them to do which allows me to make the point, vaccines do not create a force field around us to keep the virus out of our bodies. What they do is they make sure our body can respond effectively to deal with the virus once it does get into our system. And so um, what, what's next for, for the Nashvilleian of the year? For the, for the, for the person of the year, what's, what's next for you in, in, in just professionally, kind of how things well, are going on, is that Meharry, community-wide? Well, I'm excited about uh, what we're doing at Meharry, you know, we, we've started some new programs. We have a new school of applied computational sciences. We started that because I believe that data, understanding data, having a facility with data is going to be important for success in the future. So we're going to train up some black and brown mm -hmm. biomedical data scientists who can actually help us make sure algorithms are not biased, do other things. We're hopeful to be starting a physician assistant program pretty soon. We've had our site visit for accreditation. We're waiting to see what the results are. We're feeling pretty uh, pretty good about that. And we're also planning in the planning phase for starting a school of public health. Okay. Because what the pandemic also revealed was the public health system in our country is fragmented, ineffective, poorly resourced. And we need to start training individuals who can be embedded in communities to drive the health of those communities from within and that's going to be one of the focuses of our of our school when we launch our new school of public health. So I'm excited about Meharry. We have the best students, I believe, in the country. Mm -hmm. They make us proud every day. Uh, I love relating to people that we take students that more well-known medical schools reject. Mm -hmm. And by the time we're done with them, those same schools are recruiting our students as residents, which speaks to how hard my faculty work to get them ready but also the quality of the students that we attract. So I'm just thrilled to be Meharry's chief cheerleader. I'm very excited about the future. Well, Dr. Hildreth, um, I really appreciated this time that you that you gave me uh, for being here and from your busy day. <laughs> um, and is there, I wanna give you the last word. Um, is there anything that our viewers and, and listeners, um, and we're talking directly you know, to the national community here, I want you to just be aware of that maybe some of our questions didn't get to today. Oh. Well, I think that one of the things I'd like to share with people is that if we don't do something soon, the polarization in our country is going to have a very bad outcome. We've come to a point where difficult conversations about difficult things are necessary, mm -hmm. about race, about the change in climate. Climate change is real. I mean, for God's sakes. Right. And also about accepting people for who they are. This whole thing about having bias against people who are different for whatever reason. We just seem to be looking for ways to hate each other. And I just think it's, the time has come 
to have some really challenging open conversations if we're going to move forward together as a country. And I hope people will consider that and do that. I mean, we have a habit, and I know I'm guilty of it sometimes, of seeking out information that reinforce our own beliefs. Right. We've got to take some time to maybe listen to some sources and uh, people who might have a different opinion than ours and have a way to find out what we share in common and find a way to move forward together. So I think the time has come for that. It's definitely needed. Well, and that's why this platform is here, you know, to create a brave space to be able to have those um, those conversations that can be very tense. Mm -hmm. But tense can be healthy. You can be a healthy tense, right? Yes. And um, hopefully, you know, that's, that's what is achieved here. And uh, hopefully this conversation that we had can, can start other brave and healthy tense conversations in other communities outside of Nashville, but definitely here and, um, you know, see what health justice look like. And yes. All of those things, right, and dive, mm -hmm. take a deeper dive into it. So I appreciate you being open and sharing your journey, and, uh, and I'm pretty sure people learned something about you that they didn't know. <laughs> right. Um, and just got into your, and, and learned about your perspectives of things, right? And so I really appreciate that, Dr. Hendrick. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the work you're doing. Oh, no. I Thank you. I could, you know, hey, I'm learning. I'm always growing and learning. And uh, I try to learn and take away something from every guest that I have. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Until next time.